Hello, everybody. Welcome to Douglas Niles Beyond the Front Page with Robert Preston Jr. I am Robert Preston Jr. And got a couple of things I want to talk about, some stories I want to look at that we've covered here at Douglas Now over the last week and see where those discussions lead over the next few minutes or so. Uh, first of all, I want to give a shout out to the Childhood Cancer Awareness Group of Coffee County, very worthy organization. We're, we're, we're wearing our, our uh, Childhood Cancer Awareness Group t-shirt today. Uh, once again, a, a fantastic organization that does so much good in Douglas, Coffee County, and surrounding communities, assisting children and families uh, who have been affected by childhood cancer. They have a Facebook page, a website, uh, a lot of information about them and what they do. Really, really active organization, fantastic group of folks here who do a tremendous job in very difficult situations. Again, they, they, they take a lot of the problems, a lot of the burdens, a lot of the issues that families and children who are affected by childhood cancer have and do their very best to bring relief to them in any way that they can. And it's really, really an unbelievable organization do tremendous work here in Douglas and Coffee County. Uh, a couple of things I want to talk about that we've covered over the last week. We're going to sort of tear, uh, tear a couple of stories from the headlines here and then talk about them a little bit and, 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 and give a little bit of opinion and a little bit of perspective on a couple of things that have happened here lately. First of all, kind of the biggest story, maybe the most interesting story to me involves uh, a press release that the Douglas Police Department put out. Uh, I think they put it out on Friday. Uh, and, and, and what they wanted to do or what they said they were going to do is they were letting citizens know that the police department is going to be beefing up its patrols around town. You're going to see a greater police presence within the city. Now, the reason for that is because we've had an uptick in gun violence, gun incidents, if you will, here in the city. And there have been several, I don't know if shootings is the right word, but incidents of firearm discharges, unlawful discharges, without, thankfully, without any injuries, without anyone, uh, without anyone getting shot. But there have been an alarming number over the last few weeks to the point that the police department is saying, listen, we want to stop this before somebody does get hurt. And something kind of interesting happened over the weekend after this press release came out. We're going to talk about that too. Uh, there have been at least five shootings over the last few weeks. And I say shootings, these are times when gunshots were reported. Okay. And probably at least one incident involved a drive by shooting at a home and then someone at the home returning fire, nobody hurt, nobody injured. Uh, thank goodness. Uh, but certainly don't want bullets flying around a neighborhood. You don't want bullets flying around anywhere, but certainly not in a neighborhood. What is interesting though, is when these incidents happen and these reports are made and the police respond and begin to conduct their investigations in every single one of these cases, there's little to no information from the complainants. Okay, either the complainants want to remain anonymous or it was someone in the neighborhood who reported the incident. And when officers arrived at the scene of the incident, which again may not have been where the report came from, uh, people haven't wanted to give a lot of information. So you've got a number of incidents over the last few weeks where guns have been discharged, police responded, but it's one of those things where nobody seems to know anything. And it's very difficult for the police to do their job, impossible, in fact, if people will not be forthcoming with information. Uh, so what the police department decided to do is, look, you're not going to help us out. We are going to beef up patrols and try to stop these incidents before they happen, which is, of course, what our law enforcement should be doing anyway. Um, it's very difficult. Those of you who are in private business know it's hard to find people to work. Well, it's hard to find people to work in the public sector as well. Uh, so the police department, sheriff's office, state patrol doing the best they can with the resources they have. <laughs> but what the police department is going to do again within the city is to beef up their patrols. And one of the reasons why is if people see blue lights, if people see police out and about, it cuts down on crime. It cuts down on all crimes. It cuts down on speeding. It cuts down on other traffic violations, and then it, you get into the more nefarious crimes, the aggravated assaults and armed robberies and things like that. 
what it does is it sends a message to the criminal element in our area that police are out and about in Douglas. And if you are going to ply your trade in Douglas, you very well may run into trouble from the police. Now, that's a good idea. And uh, I'm certainly glad that the police are doing that. An incident happened on Friday night uh, at the uh, uh, at the George Washington Carver Shopping Center that was kind of a, I think, really a sort of a uh, kind of a uh, the the poli- uh, the criminal element sending a message to the police uh, and a pretty strong message at that <clears throat> and this again this is just a few hours after this press release was issued uh, uh, there were some people down at the George Washington Carver Shopping Center here in Douglas that most people commonly know that area as the block uh, there were a group of people down there at the block there was an officer nearby traffic stop traffic stop took place at a store not far away. Uh, officer called for a little bit of help. So the officer who was at the block headed that way to make sure that the officer initiating the traffic stop did not need any assistance. Within minutes of leaving, within minutes, we're talking, I don't know, five minutes or so, um, according to the timeline I've been told of that officer leaving the shopping center, over 60 shots rang out, multiple people shooting, multiple weapons, shooting in different directions. These shots were not aimed at, uh, at any individuals or any groups of people. Uh, you know, you'd think that if somebody was firing that many rounds that they were firing at somebody, somebody would get hit, but there were no injuries. However, there were vehicles that sustained bullet damage. There were homes and churches that sustained damage as well. All in all for the amount of uh, gunfire there was, there were very few uh, damages reported, but, those damages were, you know, there were damages. <laughs> now, what's kind of interesting here, if you want to back up almost two years, it was July of 2020, Mayor Tony Polk got raked across the coals. I mean, absolutely eviscerated by a group of citizens because he said and did an interview with a news outlet from Southwest Georgia where he said that he wanted to see these types of activities stopped in the city. And he was particularly referencing the George Washington Carver Shopping Center. Now, this did not set well with a number of citizens uh, in the city of Douglas. And there was a meeting, sort of a, I, I wouldn't call it a town hall meeting, but a public meeting, where the mayor met with citizens at the George Washington Carver Shopping Center and expressed his thoughts and opinions on what was going on. He had a plastic bag full of shell casings. And this was, you know, again, in July, early July, mid July. And he had said that the day after July 4th, which would be July 5th, that he had picked those shell casings up from the parking lot of the George Washington Carver Shopping Center. Now, this was met with a a pretty good bit of, uh, of opposition. A lot of folks did not like the fact that the mayor was stating and had stated that criminal activities, bad things were taking place at the George Washington Carver shopping center. And now here we are less than two years later, you know, 21, 22 months later, and you've got an incident at the same place where over 60 shots ring out. Now, thankfully, the tide of public opinion has shifted a little bit, and there are some some folks who have a stake in the George Washington Carver Shopping Center who want to see this see this end. And I, you know, I obviously don't don't have don't own any property at the George Washington Carver Shopping Center. There are only a couple of property owners uh, uh, at that at that complex who who, who own businesses there. But you know, this is pretty bad for the city. And this sends a bad message, not just what happened there, but these incidents of, of, of gun violence in our community. So didn't get a whole lot of comments there. It didn't run like I thought it would, but this is something that we need to keep an eye out on. And the biggest thing, of course, is to help the police. If we, you know, there's a see something, say something campaign, 
and a lot of people are seeing things, but they aren't saying anything. And one of the big, one of the big concerns of mine for our community as a whole has been the safety of our children and our families. And I, I tend to, to be pretty heavy handed with things that affect that. I have teenage children. I have family members, close family members who have young children. And I'm concerned about the environment in Douglas and Coffee County that our, that our kids are growing up in. And it doesn't know it's not confined to any one neighborhood. It's not confined to any age group or any, um, you know, pick a group. It's not confined to that. We have a problem across the board, across the demographic breakdown of our community, across the socioeconomic status from lower class to upper class. We're dealing with a lot of problems here. And I, I want to see our community as a whole come together and let's make our community a safer place. This kind of stuff bothers me. And then, you know, we're, we're going to talk about a, a drug arrest here in just a second that took place up in Broxton. All of this stuff, the guns, the drugs, I think a lot of it has to do with a lack of people working. I think that, um, our unemployment's too high in, in Coffee County. And you can look and see at the businesses that are closed or the businesses that alter their hours that aren't open like they used to because they can't find people to work. Well, it's not because we don't have people here in our community. We have people here, but people aren't interested in staying busy and working the way that they need to. It, le it lends itself to a lot of bad behavior. And I wish that we could get our law enforcement agencies on the same page to to get really aggressive and enact a comprehensive plan for our community to make it a safer place. It's not going to just be an election here or an election there or hiring officers here or buying new cars or what have you. It's going to take a concerted effort. It's going to take cooperation among all of the agencies who are here in order to truly make this a, 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 a much a much safer community. I'm really, it's something I've been concerned about now, probably going back to 2015, 2016. And some of my complaints have fallen on deaf ears. I've had people get mad at me because of my stance on a few things. And, 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 and I, I can be a little heavy handed with it, but there are strategies that have worked in other communities. And while you can't take a one size fits all approach to different communities, we can certainly look at what's happened and come up with our own set of best practices to put in place, to try to get rid of our drug dealers, to try to get rid of the meth, um, uh, to get rid of the criminals who make life difficult for our children and families, you know, and, and, and that, that's what I would like to see. And that's what concerns me. The greater message or the greater, uh, application here of what we're talking about. The city needs to beef up patrols, but we need, we need beefed up patrols all over the place. Not necessarily to write more tickets. All right. But it sends a message when you see blue lights, it sends a big message when you see blue lights and, but blue lights don't necessarily mean tickets. Okay. What it means is, is that we're serious about running the criminals out of our community and as you can see, you can just read through the press releases that we publish. There are plenty of fairly substantial drug seizures that take place during traffic stops. So, you know, plenty of times a traffic stop will lead to something much, much bigger. And that's another, you know, another benefit of, of, of blue lights. There's a lot of drugs that pass through coffee County. Some of it stops here. Some of it doesn't, but if you have more aggressive patrols, then you can stop some of that. And even you don't have to stop all of it. You just have to send messages to the dealers. They understand, look, we don't need to go into Coffee County. We don't need to do that. There's a pretty good chance we're going to get stopped and we're going to get into, you know, it's going to open up a can of worms that we don't want to deal with. So I think the police department's taking the right approach, but I think it's just the beginning. I think we need a more comprehensive approach to making our community a safer place. And, and one of the things, one of the connections I don't see made a whole lot is the connection between law enforcement and economic development. 
uh, you know, law enforcement is not on an island by itself. Neither is the economic development side of our community. They go hand in hand. If we want a community that's attractive to business and industries, we've got to have a uh, we've got to have a community that doesn't tolerate drug dealing, drug use, drug abuse. At the very least, at the very least, you're not going to be able to find employees to come work because they can't pass drug tests. And that's a problem that I've had. I have, I don't know how many people I've sent to take drug tests and I can't hire anybody unless they take a drug test. I've sent plenty of people to take drug tests who come back and fail. And it's very hard for us to fill our positions when folks can't pass drug tests. So in addition to that, you, you, you know, you have the lack of work ethic, uh, among people who use drugs. So there's a greater, there, there's a greater issue here. And I think you have to look outside of let's just round up a few drug dealers. I think you have to look at how it affects our community as a whole, how it affects our system of education, how it affects our employment, how it affects the attractiveness uh, to other, uh, uh, to business and industry. It all goes hand in hand. And that's what I would like to see. Uh, that's what I would like to see here in Douglas and Coffee County. Let's make our community a safer place. And, and let's, let's send a message all around. All right. That we're, uh, that we're not a place for criminals to come. And I think, again, this is a step in the right direction, but it's not all that needs to be done. We really need to, to we really need a more, uh, a more comprehensive approach. And I hope this is the first step in doing that. As I mentioned up in Broxton, May 4th, uh, Veronica Maldonado was arrested uh, and charged with, with possession of meth, uh, found in possession of around two kilos of methamphetamine, according to the press release that came out from the sheriff's office, around a $31,000 street value. Two kilos of meth is a lot, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to what is here and compared to what is moved in and out of here on a regular basis. And I, I certainly want every single drug dealer that we can find rounded up. I want every ounce of illegal drugs taken off of our streets but we have to keep things into perspective that as, as big of a deal as this is, and that, you know, in the Broxton police department was right there, sheriff's office right there. There were other agencies that assisted in the grand scheme of things. Is that going to make a big difference in what is happening here in our community? Probably not, probably not. So, you know, again, I read these stories, I see what happens, but I'm really hoping that again, these are just stepping stones. Okay. Um, good bust, good job by our officers, but there's so much more work here that needs to be done. And there's so much bad behavior that goes with this kind of stuff. So working on it little by little, but I'm hoping that, you know, again, all of this stuff works together to, uh, um, to lead to, more and more and bigger and bigger bust. I'll tell you one thing I like to look at. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways of looking at the effectiveness of, 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 of drug bust. And it certainly looks good and sounds good when a large amount of drugs is found. I also like to see a large number of people arrested. And this not, this is not to take away on what happened up in Brox and all. I don't want anybody to think that. <clears throat> But I think you also keep in mind that you got to get people off the streets too. So yeah, we like to get big drug seizures, but let's also get a lot of people off the streets because the bigger the drug dealer, the less likely you are to find drugs on them. And you may say that doesn't make a lot of sense, but you think about those who are moving the pieces around and who are controlling the drug trade, they're going to keep as much of that stuff as possible at an arm's length. All right. And some of our most notorious drug dealers uh, here that, that, that have been arrested are found with a surprisingly little amount of drugs on them. All right. They're pretty good at trying to keep everything away from them as much as possible. They're calling the shots and they're moving the pieces around, but they're not necessarily peddling the drugs themselves. So 
there's 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 two you know there's two different sides of that coin look at the number of drugs seized and you also look at the number of people who are arrested and you know you have to have a lot of drugs that come off the streets and also a lot of people arrested but <clears throat> again I, 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 these actions that we're seeing and we had a pretty good week law enforcement wise in 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 the in the city and the county last week but just want to see just want to see them keep their foot on the gas keep their foot on the gas and let's continue to work to make Douglas and Coffee County a very inhospitable place for criminals, drug dealers, and the various and sundry other bad elements that tend to take up in a community. One good story, I think it's a good story. It, it's, it's not without controversy, but we ran a press release last week, ran a story about Pilgrim's Pride expanding here in the city. And and what what Pilgrims is going to do is going to build a facility to that will take the remnants of the manufacturing process and turn that into pet food. Um, now it's not without controversy because a lot of people are concerned. Just to put it bluntly, what's it going to smell like? What is this new plant going to smell like? Because if you've been around one of these rendering facilities in the past, it's not, it's not always pleasant, <clears throat> but we have been assured by our leaders that with the modern technology that we have, that <clears throat> through various filters and pressures and all this stuff that they can do inside the facilities, that it will be largely odor free. All right. Uh, that's there are a few people who are concerned about that and a few people who don't believe that <clears throat> but uh, our 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 city officials visited a very similar plan in another part of the country and they came back saying that it was amazing that it was basically odor free so uh, and then you certainly don't want to think of that with this particular facility that's not really the most positive thing but what is positive is the fact that Pilgrim's Pride will now have its entire operation here in Coffee County. And by that, I mean, we've got a hatchery, we have a feed mill, we have a processing plant, and then we will have a facility, uh, a post-processing plant, if you will, to take the remnants of the processing operation and then turn it into something useful here in Douglas and Coffee County. And we remember what happened. You go back to 2008, 2009, when Pilgrim's Pride left, it was an enormous blow to our community, a tremendous blow. And, and even after Pilgrim's Pride came back, it took a while for us to, to get over the ill effects that the temporary uh, 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 departure caused. I think overall, this is pretty good for Douglas and Coffee County. It's going to give us more jobs. It's going to give us some management positions. It's going to give people an opportunity to get higher paying jobs that they would not have otherwise had. Now, one issue that we do have to look at when you're talking about this new manufacturing facility, and you're also looking at the new retail that's coming in through uh, uh, the Douglas Square Shopping Center and the other retail uh, 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 stores that will be built because there are others coming. That entire Southern portion of the city is absolutely being transformed in front of our very eyes. What's happening over at Douglas square is not the only development that's going to take place in that area. So we're going to get an influx of retail businesses here in Douglas and coffee County. They're going to need to be staffed. So we're, you know, that's something we need to look at. We need to make sure that we've got the workers in order to staff these particular businesses, both on the retail side and the manufacturing side. And again, that's where I want to see our law enforcement step in and play a role in that in helping make sure that we get all this bad stuff out of here as quickly as possible and keep it out of here so that our workforce isn't negatively affected. It's also going to create opportunities for our graduates as well. And, and one of the things I like to see is our kids graduate from high school, be able to go to college here, 
graduate from college. And of course we know what Wiregrass Tech is doing. And then of course, uh, uh, South Georgia State College has, has a, a, a pretty good offering of four year degrees as well. So you can graduate from high school here. You can get a four year degree here and then you can get out of school and stay here and work. And that's what we would like to see. We would like to see our best and brightest stay here and contribute to our community uh, uh, m- moving forward. So the Pilgrim's Pride expansion is pretty big. Uh, it's, it's, it, again, it's not totally without controversy and I understand the concerns that people have, but overall, I think it's going to be good for our community and, and I'm, I'm looking forward to it again. We, we always like to talk about the negative, but if you look at what's happening from an optic standpoint, from an economic development standpoint in our community, Douglas is going to be a very different place in just a few short years. I already argue that it is. It's already a very different place, but you give it another couple of years and we can get the publics in here. We can get this, this rendering facility in here. You can get highway 32 four lane. Things are going to look a lot different. You get Douglas square fixed up, get it finished and then get the other retail facilities finished over the next couple of years. Douglas and coffee County are going to be very different places. And, and I hope that we're able to keep up with our workforce and keep up with our population growth in order to staff these, all right, in order to staff these facilities. But I think that's, that's going to be an issue. And then of course you also look at, at the, at the strain that these new businesses and new industries are going to, are going to, uh, to cause on our infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I think we've got to, we've got to make sure that we invest in our water, sewer and utilities. And that's, you know, we got a couple of city commissioners, uh, uh, city commission races. And those issues are what the commission candidates need to be investigating and need to be looking into because that's where they can make the most impact. It's going to take a fairly substantial investment over the next few, uh, over the next few years, I'd say five to 10 years to keep up with the growth that we're experiencing. We're outgrowing our infrastructure. We've got to make sure that the infrastructure can handle the growth that we have. So again, these are good problems to have worried about staff and all the business and industries that are coming to town, worried about our infrastructure because we're outgrowing it. Th- these are, these are really good problems to have, but we need leadership in place to make sure that we can solve these problems and we can continue uh, to lead Douglas and coffee County down the right path. One last story I want to talk about real quickly. This is a, we're going to end on a positive note. Uh, uh, we also, we, we ran a release last week, the coffee high baseball program, is going to upgrade its batting cage and going to turn the batting cage into an indoor hitting facility. And it's going to name that facility after the late Ricardo Ingram. Now, when you talk about athletes and you talk about who the best is and all this, that, and the other, you get into a number of different arguments, some based on facts, some based on statistics, some based on opinions, most based on emotion. I don't think it is, and uh, uh, I don't think it's it's wrong to state that Ricardo Ingram is the greatest all-around athlete we've ever had to come out of Coffee High School. There are a lot of athletes who made a tremendous impact on our community who have done very well. But in terms of all-around excellence, you'd be hard-pressed to find anybody who was better than Ricardo Ingram. And you can look at what he did in high school. You can also look at what happened afterwards. He went to Georgia Tech, graduated the class of 1984, went to Georgia Tech where he played football and baseball at Tech. He was the ACC's Athlete of the Year, Male Athlete of the Year when he was up there. I believe he was the first ACC Male Athlete of the Year from Georgia Tech. <clears throat> he went on, I mean, all ACC, still in the record books, tremendous football career, tremendous baseball career. He went on and played professional baseball. Just a couple of his statistics. Uh, he played professional baseball from 1988 to 1997. Uh, he played five years in triple A, two years in double A, two years in single A. His minor league statistics, he hit 74 home runs, 428 RBIs with a 300, uh, 332 batting average. He also played 16 games in the major leagues. He played 12 games in 1994 with the Detroit Tigers and played four games 
with the Minnesota Twins in 1995. He finished with a 171 batting average. You'll see Ricardo on a highlight reel for Major League Baseball. However, <laughs> his highlight is uh, is actually a Ken Griffey Jr. highlight when he was playing with Detroit. Uh, Ricardo hit what should have been um, his first Major League home run, uh, but they were playing the Seattle Mariners, and Griffey went back in center field and jumped up and robbed him of his home run. So, so Ricardo's Major League high, uh, claim to fame is he provided Ken Griffey Jr. with one of his many, many highlights. But Ricardo is an unbelievable athlete, unbelievable player. After he retired from baseball, he coached with the Twins organization and 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 was a valued member of that organization. Um, unfortunately, uh, cancer got him, and uh, he had a very aggressive form of cancer, died in 2015. Now, sort of if there's a problem that I have with any of this, is one thing we tend to do in Douglas and Coffee County is we wait till people pass away before we recognize them. I would love to have seen Ricardo recognized before – cancer took him from us so soon and there are plenty of other athletes i think and not just athletes uh, but musicians and artists and uh and, and, and statesmen uh who need to be recognized in our community and for whatever reason we just we, we tend to wait until it's too late or wait until the individuals we're recognizing don't get to enjoy being recognized and i think that's important I mean, you know, if you ask these guys and these girls, they would say that the recognition doesn't mean anything to them, but you know it does. And when you have people who have exhibited excellence in your community and have left a lasting legacy, I don't see the reason why you wait and recognize them. I think you should look for those opportunities. And and and, and Ricardo Ingram has been recognized twice. The baseball program recognized him in 2016, about a year after he passed away. And then here we are recognizing him again with the uh, uh with naming the hitting facility after him but i could go down a, a list of people who we need to we need to recognize i'm not gonna do it now because i'll leave somebody out and people will get mad at me and all that we'll have this debate at another time we absolutely will but 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 it really uh it, i really liked what the baseball program is doing the board of education approved it and they're going to raise some money uh, to to improve the facility, and then they're going to name it after Ricardo, and then Ricardo's mother's still here, in in, in Douglas. Um, his brother Reggie is is a, is a teacher and a coach. <clears throat> a lot of his teammates are still around. If you have any doubt, if you if you aren't familiar with what Ricardo did, find somebody and ask them. Some of his teammates, some of the folks who watched him play, some of his family members, his friends, they will tell you he was absolutely unbelievable. One of the hardest hitters on the football field that you would ever find. I don't think, man, I say this in a good way. I don't think Ricardo would, would, would make it today in today's game. Uh, Ricardo was just as nice as he could be smiled all the time. You know, one of the greatest people you'll ever be around. But when he stepped between the lines of the football field, whoever was on the other side was his absolute sworn enemy. And he did everything he could to let them know that, uh, he was a defensive back and he was, he was one of those head hunters. And, and, and he, he would lead with his head and he wanted to hit people just as hard as he possibly could. And that type of, 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 of play doesn't go well with today with targeting and all that. He wouldn't like it. I don't think he'd like the way they play, but he was, uh, he was not just a very talented defensive back when he was at Georgia tech, he was absolutely feared. He was one of the most feared defensive players in the Atlantic coast conference. And anyone who lined up against him knew why. So again, I'm, 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 I am honored to say that I knew Ricardo and that I got to watch him play and got to see him play through his high school years and his college years. I was very young. All right. So, uh, uh, at the time I didn't have the appreciation for what I was seeing that I do now, but I can tell you this, you know, we've got tremendous athletes come out of Douglas and Coffee County, tremendous athletes played at the highest levels, won World Series and won Super Bowls. But I do not think that it is uh, that it is incorrect to state that the best all around, no matter what sport it was, was Ricardo Ingram. And he proved that <clears throat> post-high school. He was able to compete with the best in the country uh, in Division I athletics and also made it to the highest levels of professional baseball. Um, just, just an unbelievable honor. It's a shame Ricardo's not around to, uh, uh, to see it. 
and uh, I certainly hope that he's looking down and, and he's got a, he's got that big smile on his face, seeing the recognition that his community has, his contributions uh, have not been forgotten and will not be forgotten. And we appreciate everything that he did for our community and that his family continues to do for our community. That's all I've got for today. Thanks for watching. Uh, we appreciate you tuning in and we will be back next week. You've been watching beyond the front page with Robert Preston, Jr. DouglasNow.com. Check us out. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well on Instagram. We're Douglas now news. Check us out. Um, uh, we appreciate you watching. We'll see you next time. Y'all have a good week.